progress. Hello. Hello, Julie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's better, isn't it? Yeah, well, unfortunately, when, when the light is behind, it creates that strange effect. Is it working all right, my connection? Perfect. It's wonderful. Yes, yeah, really good. <laughs> so, now, oh, how are you? I'm very, I'm very good. I'm very happy. I love this house because yes. it's full of memories. Of course, do you feel at home. Yeah. You are at home. <laughs> I'm yeah. at home, and uh, and I'm. I will be with my mom for a few days. Yeah. So it's oh, it's really nice. That's lovely. This piece of furniture is coming home with me at some point. Yeah. Really? Home. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah show me. Yeah. Wow, it's beautiful. I love it. I love this time. I hold all the stuff. Really like it. I think my that's my internet's not so good, is it? I can hear you very well. Oh, it went off a bit, but I think maybe you turned around. Thank you, Lena. Thank you very much. Oh. No, no, it's para gasolina or ah. algo. Mm -hmm. Poquito extra. Sí. Gracias. Oh, gracias eh. a ti. Oh my god. <laughs> He apagado los dos neveras arriba. Sí. Como no hay apagado. Nada, no, hace okay. no hace falta. No, no hace falta. Yo creo que la puerta está abierta. Sí. sí. Yo esto lo tiro. Oh, sí. oh muchas gracias, Lina. Ah. Ok. Que tengáis muy Nos que vemos tengáis muy luego, otro día. Sí. Sí, no sé exactamente uh, no, no. qué bien, pero so, lo tenemos marcado. Sí, sí. ok. Gracias, bueno, señora. gracias. Oh, I'll just go and lock the door, Marco. Sorry. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't Right, I'm, I'm going to make you host before anything else terrible happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maggie's coming in now. <laughs> oh, I'll let her in first then. Yeah. <laughs> Marco, make host. It's 16 hours. Um, Hello, hello, Maggie. Hello, Marco. How are you today? <laughs> I'm very good. I'm very good. Glad to hear How it. How are you doing? Well, yeah. uh, welcome to the third meeting of the Dorian Valiente Book Club. This is our third meeting at which we were discussing a book, but a fourth meeting in which we are making good plans together. Um, right now we are discussing The Witch Ball and other short stories. Dorian's, I guess, they love the um, Vanna. Thank you so much. The, um, the hope is that people who wanted to have a chance to talk about this book have been here and and i think that that might not be true maybe people missed it or didn't get a chance to share or participate in the conversation so um so we can talk about the possibility of having a sort of a catch-up day at some point for this book uh where people want to talk about the specifics um but i think our intention was to finish the last two chapters and kind of the book as a whole today and then Next time, our meeting in June is to move on to our next book, I believe we said was going to be uh, The Rebirth of Witchcraft. Uh, and now we can certainly change our minds because here we are together, but that was the one that had come up for us. Um, does that sound about right for books for today? All right. right. 
Today is indeed May Day, and we are uh, we are competing with lots of other exciting uh, okay. things happening in people's lives. So hopefully, everybody's having a very good and warmer day than I am. <laughs> the, the participant of your of your your beautiful dogness. You have to tell us what your dog's name is. It's a requirement. Oh, well, the, the, the little one that's not barking right now is, uh, is Georgia, and she has recently discovered that my lap is a nice cozy place to sit because I have a heated blanket on my chair, mm -hmm. and she likes to share it with me, and she also is going through some kind of clingy phase, so, yeah. Thank you, Thank you for, for sharing your, your animals with us. All right. Well, I don't think we had anybody specifically who had claimed either one of these chapters. Is that true or am I missing my notes? Uh, was there any, we, we can just kind of start generally, were there any thoughts that people had had about the book as a whole or these two chapters in particular people wanted to bring up? I think that there's been a, a lot of kind of quite um, highfalutin, if you like, discussion about, um, about this book, but what it reminds me of is, is just the famous five a little bit <laughs> because they're just little adventures, aren't they? Adventures within adventures. It just does remind me of those, those short stories I used to read as a kid, which is probably like really off the point, but they're quite fun to read, I think, and, and quite, you know, quite entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, they yeah. are. I if think, my dogs go nuts, I'm going to mute my. Um, that's totally video. fair. <laughs> they bark at everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I do think that her writing tends to be a little bit on the sensationalist side, and I, I think she she gets a little on the the eerie horror qualities. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the comics I read as a kid, the, the Crypt Keeper and. Um, yeah, I, I love those sorts of things. It makes it a little bit extra spooky. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, this, these two in particular were very spooky. Um, <laughs> I do like horror novels. They don't, they're, ta they're tame, but, I, but uh, the, the, the supernatural elements, I think, make it even more interesting. Mm. Yeah. yeah, sort of a folk horror kind of yeah. bend because it's that, that there's just enough sort of relatability, just enough you know, believability with this weird sort of folkloric edge that just has a certain type of creepiness that I love. Agreed. Agreed. And I also like the feeling like it's just the setting is very familiar. Like the, 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 it's set in Brighton. Here we are, you know, in town and here's this old house, not all that old. And then they're going to look at it and something very sinister is happening inside of it and yeah. mm -hmm. not at all witchy. I think the things that were that were important to me about these two chapters or that really um, that really stood out were the ways in which um, well, the main characters is it Ashton is that his name? A, a, yeah. An a, and a B name. I always forget their actual names. Blake. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Blake and Ashton. Ashton. Yeah. Ashton Ashton. Ashton. Blake is there. They feel like they've gotten to know each other pretty well at this point. They, and that Blake can sort of rely on Ashton to answer his questions without having to. There's, there's, a, there's a sense of, of uh, trust that's built up there over yeah. time, which is really key. Um, and then that these two chapters involve the occult in a way that is sort of non witchy and they're really making a differentiation here between the things that Ashton can do and the things that are happening in the chapter. So that this is not, this is not what witches do as much as they might like to pretend that's what it is. So we have like this black Sabbath and the experience of calling uh, demons or um, the old gods, according to the Necron Necronomicon, which makes me laugh a little bit. And the whole, um, um, you know, devil worship idea that of what witchcraft is. And then on the other side, you have kind of like the 
cunning folk um, experience of old George and what he's doing in his house and the farm. It's like, this is just what people do. Uh, that really, really struck me as being uh, very clear now. Maybe it's more clear to Blake too, by the time he gets to the end of chapter 11, that he's like, okay, I know that this is the good kind of, of a cult and this is the bad kind of a cult. And, uh, and he has a much better uh, comfortable nature with it. The whole, mm, the thing about chapter 10, the one that was the, called the quest of the book, this was the one in which the, that um, Blake had two properties in Brighton. And then one of them was um, some bad, weird things were happening. Uh, it seemed like I was a little struck by Ashton's decision to rely on Tibetan magic or what he like said, identified as Tibetan magic here. What do you guys think about that? Mm. I found it very interesting uh, as well. Um, because, can, you, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, the room is quite empty and there is a big, uh, a lot of echo. And um, I really enjoyed uh, the fact that once again, Doreen speaks about objects. <laughs> So once again, she she speaks about something. I I I obviously looked at the Furba sort of blade, and to me, I think this is really a very effective image of what Wicca was at the beginning, and probably still is. This attempt to really mix certain traditions with others it's constant this knowledge from these that clearly Gardner brought back it's somewhere there and and, and heaven for some reason and strangely enough it's a blade which Gardner was very obsessed about, you know, all the, the, the passion towards the Chris, the Malaysian blades, etc. So I found it very, extremely interesting. Uh, interesting that it's not a proper blade, but it's a ritual item. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. something that needs to be explained to the public. Um, and so I, I am not, I'm not sure we've got a furba in the collection. However, we've got a Tibetan bell and we have got, yeah. and you must forgive me, I don't remember the name, an item which usually goes strictly uh, connected with the furba and the bell. It's, it's a double-ended sort of little rod. Oh, yeah. I know, and it looks like a crown on each end. Brava. Yeah. Yes, I can't remember what. Do you? Does anyone know what those would be called? I don't know what you mean. What? What? Yeah. what how are they connected? What do they do? Uh, I need to show. You. I know what you mean. I just it's can't wrong. remember what they're called. I'll get it. We the bookstore I sometimes work in sells those bell and and little sets, and I can't remember. Yeah. Huh. They're ritual items and they're like two brass crowns on each end, like a crown that a king would wear, connected by a grass, a brass. Dorje, D-O-R-J-E. Dorje, yeah. okay. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> if I can share screen, I can show you. Am I allowed to share screen? Yeah, uh, well, let me we... see. There's a participants, Dodi. Uh, well, I'll make you a co-host. I think then you can do it. Okay, I think I can do it now. I think you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you, is the piece you're speaking about look like like this? Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you see, like it has got the same um, sort of uh, um, object yes. that it's on the handle of the of the bell, which we have. Yeah. Yeah. So we certainly have these two items in the collection. Yes. Uh, so, and, and now now I wonder 
what was there a particular interest that came from Doreen into Tibetan uh, ritual tools, or did she inherit this interest and this knowledge maybe from Ghana? I don't know, but I found it very interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. We've also got a Tibetan goddess with a red uh, lotus leaf behind her, well, shape leaf. And I can't remember what that one's called as well, but I think it's Tibetan as well, the goddess. We need to look at this Tibetan yes. narrative in the collection. Yes. That's you know, it almost feels like like just part of that sort of uh, antiquarian curious collector kind of motif that was just popular at that time, with, mm -hmm. which I love, you know, all the the strange collections, you know? Yeah. You know, with, with a, 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 everybody has that picture in their head of like the eccentric sorcerer's den with like a globe of the world and a taxidermied bat and, you know, strange <laughs> objects in jars, you know, pig fetus and, and, and little arcane figures from some strange place, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. That's an aesthetic I strive for every day. That's my office, but yeah. <laughs> That's your office. I can imagine you actually legitimately should have an office like that. Mm -hmm. I think that I, will I mean, probably not, but I, I, I would love that. Well, it ties in with the whole antique store piece that keeps coming up. You know, I think he's polishing silver at the top of chapter 10. You know, just like that sort of, I love those details, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of like life goals for myself, you know to have this, these, these strange little collections and trading in, you know, strange pieces of, of, you know, artifact from around the world, you know, kind of like a, it's, it's, Indi it, Indiana it symbolizes Jones, adventure, yeah. right? Right, right. Hmm. Well, at the top of page 127, there's a comment from Ashton where they're having, they're, this is just after he shows the picture of this, this, uh, this knife. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm just, I'm in the middle of reading the Golden Bough right now, and this oh, wow. strikes me as being very much exactly what the Golden Bough is trying to import, like that uh, the ancient wisdom is basically the same all over the world. It just receives <coughs> a different coloring according to the time and place in which it is found. Mm. And um, you know, I don't, like knowing that that's not actually true, uh, I think it is, it is interesting to see it show up here anyway. And that seems to be the theme throughout this whole book that, uh, that yes, all of this is sort of mysterious and it reminds me of old things, like all of these things like, oh, it kind of, I can, I make this connection to these older books or this older way or um, the things that were passed down or just sort of hinted at um, that's what I, I almost like what you're saying, Dodie, but only this is the out loud version of it instead of like the artifacts, this is the, the feeling of, of ancientness, even if you have no proof of it. Do you when, know what I when, mean? When, when was this collection written? Sorry, I haven't got the book in front of me. When, when was it actually written? Do we know? Or when were the stories put together? Do we know? Uh... Because, well, this is something that, Julie, uh, uh, we need to look into, I guess, because this, this book has been published posthumously. Yeah. So it's about to find out if on the actual tests we've got dates. Mm. The reason I'm asking is because I know that she did some sort of secret squirrel stuff in the Second World War, didn't she? And, um, and so I'm thinking to myself, well, this attachment to older things would maybe um you know at a time of 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 war and everything was being blasted apart and lives lives were were being kind of changed and this sort of clinging maybe to the old ways um was was um an emotional sort of perhaps an emotional draw given the context of the time in which she was writing which perhaps you know had she right. written sort of years before the war maybe it wouldn't have been so apparent in her writings is clinging to to ancient things and artifacts and stuff maybe so that's what i was just wondering for that reason 
Mm. We should look into this, Julie, to find out. Yes, we should. Yeah. Do you have any sense of when, when the manuscripts were written, uh, Julie? No, um, sometimes you can tell the, the manuscripts are written on an old typewriter, the originals, and, um, you know, later on, I think she got a word processor. You know those ones and the paper is on a roll and it's got perforations down the side. Uh, so some of the um, original uh, manuscripts are on those perforated word press word word processor type material. These were hand typed. Uh, you know when um, sometimes an old typewriter would have a letter R which is slightly crooked or something like that. Mm. You can see the anomaly there. So I think she would have had that kind of typewriter during and after the war. Mm. Just so after have been... the war, maybe in the 50s. Mm. Yeah, that would make sense in the context. But I yeah, think, that, yeah. yeah, I think it would. It's a good guess, I would guess too. Yeah. 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 Mm. <laughs> At, um, like another thing that seemed important to both of these chapters is the mention of karma and the uh, and I think when she uses the term she's not using it in any specifically eastern way but kind of in the way that many Wiccans use the term to mean sort of your fate or your destiny uh, but also your responsibility to yourself and to you know like the craft and the community in general to be your best self uh, and and I think he he reflects um, Ashton reflects on that a couple times. Like he feels like he has done not the best job, and he wants to improve. And he's going to take care of this. You know, yeah. he's going to step in and do what needs to be done because it's his responsibility to himself and to the craft, mm. yeah. uh, magical community in general, or whatever you know you would want to say. Doreen uses the word karma many times in her books and yeah. it's interesting as someone asked me lately in I think in an interview or somewhere um, what what did Doreen think about the law of three which yeah. I didn't know obviously because I didn't have the chance to be Doreen so I did a bit of research and I never found and then and I found out later on you probably all know this but that the law of three as it appears it's it's quite late really uh, yeah. it's it's something that has been established later on and it appears in the green egg at some point in the 70s uh, maybe that's the Wiccan read yeah the Wiccan read the writing of the of the the read as a precept was was published in the green egg and there there was a a scholar who dug into that that particular writer and wanted so i have i have his book and and his essays about that if, if we want to dig into it but i don't think it's really doreen doesn't have a whole lot to say about it no not at all she she never mentioned it and she but she always mentions even in, in, in the other books the concept of karma and i find it interesting because it's much more complicated than the law of three. It's much more, uh, it requires much more thinking into it. It, it, is, it is very interesting. Um, so this, this karma concept is mirrored in other, in other books. Um, and there was another thing that I uh, noticed again, uh, this is in the last one in the witch ball. It is interesting how, again, you uh, you bring together uh, something which is completely different from, from a different culture. Uh, you just spoke about karma, you just spoke about the food, but then you move into the next chapter and you speak about the cunning folk. But it's like both of these realities are part of Wicca, she doesn't say, of course, she doesn't say, she's not saying this is Wicca, but we clearly understand that whatever she writes is full of Wicca and, and the essence of Wicca. And I found it very interesting because if you think some, sometimes as, as Wiccans, we might be very sort of uh, rigid in 
what's correct, what's not. This needs to be like this. This needs to be like that. And, and, and then we do it because obviously of the, of the book of Shabbos, et cetera. However, there is this attitude about knowledge and knowing the difference and being sort of open to many traditions, so to, so to say. Yes. The whole thing is very nuanced. Um, and I will look forward to going back and digging into it again, I think, once I've thought about it some more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the corn dolly, have we covered that one yet, that chapter? Only maybe. I think there's no reason why you couldn't. <laughs> right at the beginning, um, it says, uh, not that Ashton, Ash, do you believe in witchcraft? I mean, really believe in it. A Ashton looked in some surprise. And they just had a visit to a small and very ancient Sussex church. Uh, where Ashton had been helping some of his friends and neighbours with the Harvest Festival. Now, that, not that Ashton was a regular churchgoer, but it was typical of him to count among his friends a local vicar, a rabbi and a Buddhist monk, which, while retaining his own philosophy of life, which he forced upon no one. So that's a clue as to her trying to be um, um, eclectic, I think, probably, um, and not evangelising her, uh, her own beliefs, but trying to learn about others' uh, beliefs, mm -hmm. which is reflected in the collection as well, all these Tibetan pieces and things like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things I noted about that particular chapter was it started with that question. And that was, the question was like, of, of, do you believe in magic or do you think this is real? Or do you, yeah. think, do you think this, like when he says witchcraft, I think he's talking about like, do you think this magic stuff is, is real? Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and then you get to the end of that chapter and it's pretty clear that he does think it works and yeah. he's, and uh, and that there's still not really a a clear answer about whether it's witchcraft or not. No. Um, but now, by the time we get to the end here of this, even the tenth chapter, but certainly by the eleventh, yeah. he has made it very clear that he has his own practice, mm. and that Blake knows about it, and he has been in his secret room, and he sees the Kabbalistic cross on the wall, and. And it's like the whole he he trusts him and he's like this is just part of how it is to be in ashton's world mm. uh, and that is uh, is very different than the way it was in chapter seven mm. yes that's good isn't it yeah. yes, yes, yes. and and then once again um speaking about believing in witchcraft there is that side of uh, doreen's constant worrying about black magic and the fact that black magic is out there she's got this constant worrying doesn't she the worrying that patricia well the the crowthers didn't really share back then uh, they were not really worried about the existence of black COVID and things like that no she she again sort of reminds that there, there are. But I, this, the, the, the last chapter made me thought, made, made me uh, thinking about something. There may be her obsession about black magic doesn't, uh, it's not entailed to uh, proper COVID. It's maybe what she is hinting is at the existence of groups of people who are absolutely random. But because they're random and because they do stupid things, they are quite dangerous. So they pretend to do magic, but in reality, they're all, it's all about drugs and sex yeah. and bullism and things like that. So maybe she's not really worried about proper witches doing black magic all the time. Maybe what she's trying to warn people about is, you know, you've got these groups that are reality. Yeah. They're dangerous. Yeah. 
So if you're a seeker, then how to find a, a good group, then perhaps that's what she's trying to put across then. What yeah. not to look for. Yeah. Yes. The, the excitement or the, the um, glamour. She uses the, mm -hmm. the word charlatan. She uses the word um, yeah. uh, to like to describe a, like a person who's faking. Um, and yet later on, that group does some magic <laughs> and they're scared by what they call up. And, um, and I think that the use of that term does not necessarily imply that they're not doing magic, but that mm -hmm. the kind of magic or the kind of person that they are is not, not a proper person. Right. Yeah. So don't dabble as in that teaching too in there, I think. <laughs> yeah. The way that they use those things, like that she says, or I guess, you know, Ashton says, you know, sex and drugs, if they use sex and drugs in their rituals, they have no idea what they're doing with it. They're just doing what they think it should be like, not the actual ways to use sex and drugs. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, herbal, yeah. you know, like the teachings, the old teachings that are inherent in that are, are lost and therefore just has no meaning yeah. uh, even if it works even if it does things it doesn't really it doesn't matter you're not in control you know you know you don't know what's going on yeah mm. and clearly very unethical like the whole thing the, the, the mm. chapter 11 with the um the witch ball in which this new character is introduced and her experience of being taken advantage of is you know horrific um, mm -hmm. but maybe not so unfamiliar to some of us and that is uh she is glad to have been brought into you know in touch with people who know what they're doing and, and are not going to take advantage of her yeah there's a little hint of a romantic novel coming up next right at the end there yeah. well. <laughs> i do think there is a insinuation that that could uh, that could be kind of next yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we need to dig into the archive julie who knows maybe we will find something yeah. who knows <laughs> yes yeah. Yeah. bulldog Oh, right, yeah. Bulldog Drummond was in the war, wasn't he? Uh, on page 139140. Oh, yeah, I didn't understand that reference to Bulldog no. Drummond. I've what got was that? Version of, uh, so, um, it's in the Black Dog. Uh, where's... Rugby. And if we need a bit of extra muscle, there are a couple of rugby football playing hearties in my office who'd love to join in. Join in with what? Oh, I'd have to go right back. Ashton smiled. Well, I hope it won't come to that. The Bulldog Drummond stuff went out of date with the 1930s. Mm. I don't know what that's all about. Does anyone know what that is? No. no, I don't know it. I, did, I didn't look any, up any of the references from these chapters. No, I've got an ebook version here and I can't tell you probably which page it's on. 140 or 139, is it? 139. Bulldog Drummond. I remember that, reading that, and I don't remember where I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But was that a hangover from the war? It sounds a bit warish, like that kind of jingoistic stuff, doesn't it? This is where, like, I I'm a little bit lost because uh, I don't have the same context. But yes, it's context. Bulldog <laughs> Drummond is a First World War veteran who, fed up with his sedate lifestyle advertises looking for excitement and becomes a gentleman um, adventurer and the characters appeared in novels short stories on the stage in film on radio and in graphic novels bulldog drummond there 
So there you are. So it basically suggests that you've got gentlemen rugby players who, because they're, they're fed up with the routine, if yeah. there is a fight, they could go into the fight and release all their sort of violence. Yes. Yeah. So she, she's she's basically somehow um, uh, judging even that behavior, isn't she? Like, no, we don't we yeah. don't deal with that. We don't deal with violence in that way. Mm. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I've got a question. Do you think old George in the witch ball reappears? Old George is is she hinting? Is she or is she just ev evoking George? Old George picking it. I was oh, wondering the same. Yeah, I think it could be. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Yes, definitely. I was hopeless trying to look in this book, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> George Pickingill, definitely, yeah. She, she wrote, am I correct in thinking, I've got this memory right, she wrote to, to Pickingill, um, no? Oh, Marco, you, mm. I don't know the, the archives very well. I'm, I'm not a... No, meaning. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I've, I've got a funny feeling Mm. that she, she got in touch with this person. Maybe, maybe I'm making it up and this is recorded and I'm, I'm going to be super ashamed in the future. <laughs> but who was the person who put her in contact back then with Gardner? Um, I'd have to go back and look at the biography, but um, I mean, old, the concept of old George is, is that he's, he was a hundred years before that, so I think. Mm. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. I mean, so. I don't. I don't think that no. there's a, there's a a sense that the cunning man tradition was still extant at that time, but I don't know very much about the people that uh, were addressed. Maybe to answer all these was... questions, we should make the biography a subject of uh, of one of our studies. Mm. Then we. You know the answer to a lot of questions. Of questions. No, that's true. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. I think she she was definitely aware. She knew about the about old George Pickinger because she mentions at some point. But yeah, maybe it's not the person I'm thinking about. Terrible. Movie. Um, I think Doreen. Actually, yeah. I remember now. Doreen wasn't introduced to him. She saw. You know, he was famous for. Uh, publicity and being in newspapers and on TV interviews and things. She heard of him through the media and I think, mm -hmm. she, didn't she go to the Isle of Man to seek him out and that way she became involved. I think that was not somebody put him, her in touch with him. I think she went to seek him out after she'd seen him on the media isn't that right isn't it in yeah. this moment i i get confused with names but i remember that she certainly wrote to the owner of the museum or in in on the isle of man yes uh, after she read the uh, the article uh, in in the illust in the weekly illustrated journal 1952 yeah. and she and she asked about these covens which were uh, um, talked about in the, in the in the article because the article mentioned that the, the museum and so she was like well do you know anything do you know anyone and the person which now I'm not remembering the name put yeah. uh, forward basically put her in touch directly with Gardner. Gardner was acting was was acting as the resident witch in the museum in the Isle of Man. Mm. And so they, she started this um this this exchange with Gardner and then she met him uh, in 1953 yeah. at uh, Daffo's house. Yeah. But I'm forgetting the name of the person who put in touch with I'm, yeah. I'm looking right now in the biography. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
not finding. Um, there was a source, the search for old Dorothy was part of something. She did, she did that research for when, when she was invited to, um, to contribute to uh, The Witch's Way yeah. from Janet and Stuart um, Farah. Yeah. She had the chance to yeah. publish that research um, in, 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 in The Witch's Way and then what became then The Witch's Bible. Yes. Which a lot of people were shocked about. Well, there's a chronology. Somebody's actually posted it on Facebook, the chronology. I'll copy and well, I'll send it by email to everybody. The, mm -hmm. from, from the, uh, the book? I don't know where they've got it. But it's a, they mm -hmm. call it Early Gardnerian Craft, Chronology and Bibliography of the Early Gardnerian Craft. And there's been some debate about it. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, but also, uh, it's typical <laughs> craft, isn't it? And so looking at, at the back of the book and um Oh it's a very long thing. The chronology that's there. It says yes. that he So it's, this this was the part in her life where she was um, uh, out of, unemployed and and then um, early fifties. Yeah, she would. Yeah, so she she gets she acquires this golden dawn material. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from from it says from Henry Kelf's widow, whoever owned that material, and that was yeah. how she made that connection. And then at, right after that, in November, is when she goes to Daffo's house in Highcliffe and meets Gardner. Oh. So perhaps uh, perhaps it says in that chapter about it. How, how about we make that a, a, a point and talk about it? I think we should, yeah, because we've got to study this, haven't we? Well, yeah. Understanding her life. Dodi, are you having any luck there? Oh, you're muted, yeah. All is Sorry, well. I had a bit, I have a bit of chaos. I'm, I'm doing one of those Facebook marketplace sales of a, oh, of a yeah, of equipment. My husband's out in the garage waiting for the guy and the guy's texting me saying, I'm at your house and nobody's here. I'm like, you're not at my house, dude. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm looking in, in this. At the yeah, that's where I'm looking too. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just seeing what you're seeing. Yeah. There is, there is a bit when, when she's speaking about it, the, the chapter starts, I think, with her saying, oh, I was, I was reading the, the, the paper from um, Hallam, 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 a guy <laughs> who, who was, was writing about the, the witches in Britain. And, and he was basically saying, oh, by the way, there is a museum, but also there are real covens and and he sort of, sort of like list the the real covens of which is saying oh there is a the new forest coven there is a mm -hmm. there are covens in Cumbria, which is well, it's quite exciting. Uh, I I didn't read uh, Hesselton's last book yet about the new forest coven, but it's yeah, quite in either. interesting. It is quite, maybe we should <laughs> at some point do a book club on that as well. It's quite interesting because it means that on, when she first hears about these covens, the new forest one, it's not the only one. It, there are others, but wonder, which, is, which is something that even when you when you connect the the museum of the isle of man you find again because on the isle of man there were coffins who loaned who gave some objects in on loan to the museum and when the museum closed well the museum was sold by monique wilson these objects before the big collection was sold to uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, some objects which were on loan were 
soon um, sort of collected back by these covens of the Isle of Man. So it's very interesting. Who are these people? Who were? How many covens were there? What, what do we know about them? Why? Yes. Why the only material that survived is gardeners, really? So possibly the new forest. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think she talks here, um, and I'm not sure if the pages in my Kindle version are different than the ones that yeah. I that I'm on page 67, um, where uh, it's the, just the beginning of chapter five. And her, as, as you say, the, the um, Alan Andrews article uh, from Witchcraft in, uh -huh. called Witchcraft in Britain from 1952, um, talks about the witchcraft consultant. And that's yes. Cecil Williamson from the, uh, is it Cecil? Cecil? Cecil, I guess. Cecil Williamson from ah, the- Ah, Cecil oh, Williamson, that's the guy. Is that the guy? Cecil yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So I completely made, uh, made it up, sorry, because because old George, old George was potentially was thought to maybe, maybe, but it's all, it's all, you know, uh, ideas, maybe he was training many, many years before and a uh, very young Alistair Crowley. Yeah. Uh, but it's all you, you find that in, in Ronald Hatton, I think. But it's there are no there's not much evidence. That, but people who wanted to say that, uh, I think the aim was to connect, you know, how many times Alistair Crowley is always spoken about in regards of witchcraft and not just esotericism. I think that was uh, the intention to connect it even more with coming folk and witchcraft. Sorry, it was Cecile Williamson. Of course. Okay. So George Pickingill was a cunning man. Yeah. And I'm so interested in that concept and, and the yes. practices that were around at the time. Yeah. Still, I mean, there's there's a book by Jim Baker and in which he talks about the practice before 1900 um, and the ways in which English folk magic existed from kind of yeah. 1550 on, um, but he doesn't talk about anything that's more contemporary than that. Mm. So I'm, I'm uh, lots to learn still, Mike. Uh, but I love that. I love learning about the the overlap in that particular practice, and and I think actually Hutton talks about that in his book, The Witch. Um, the big fat one, uh, a little bit. Um, I'll have to go back and reread those last couple chapters. So much. You said Jim Baker. Say again. Jim Baker. You said Jim Baker. Jim Baker. I'll put a I'll put a link in the chat yeah. to this book that uh, is on my to read list. I promised myself I won't buy any more books <laughs> right now, and I just no did. one believes. <laughs> <you>. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm finishing my basement, so I don't yeah. really want to yeah. add more books. Oh yes, Tim Baker. The coming man. All right, let's. Oh, add it to the wish. You have it already, of yeah. course. Do, do you do? There it is. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. I, it's I a lot of reading. It. It's a lot of reading, right? It's big and fat, and I look forward to digging into it at some point. And yeah. it's it's it would be a hard one to read cover to cover. I have to say. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have it too, and I would agree with that. I didn't manage to get more than twenty pages in with that, and it's just. Uh... <laughs> I'm pretty sure it came up in the context of a podcast that I was listening to about magic and magical traditions, mm, yeah. which I don't want to get too far afield here, so I won't talk about. <laughs> but feel free to email me if you want that later. <laughs> Yeah. Because it's not really about Dorian at all. But I do think that there is a lot to be um, explored in the ways in which she, I mean, she she stopped talking to Gardner pretty early on in her mm -hmm. witchy life and went off to do lots of other things. And I'd love to uh, yeah. you know the ways in which that is impacts her, her practice and her life. 
yeah. What was that? And her books, probably. Books, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like all of them were written after she wasn't working with Gardner anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting as well, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did she keep from actual Gardnerian practice? What did she added? What did she? It, it, it is very, very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that seems to be the case for a lot of gardenerian practitioners, though they kind of go off and do their own thing afterwards or yeah. deviate somewhere along the yeah. way and for whatever reason. Well, I think that's why there's just so many different strands of gardenerian practice because people can't help but be human and be influenced by other things. Yeah. So yeah. true. So true. Absolutely. But uh, you see, in Italy, you cannot call yourself a Wiccan if you don't belong to the Alexandrian Gunnerian lineage from Vivian Crowley. Did you know that? No. I know that that is a feeling some people have. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, <laughs> hey, ho. <laughs> hey, ho. Specifically, <laughs> specifically from Vivian Crowley or? Yeah. Oh, no, no. She, she's not involved at all in this lesson. She she probably doesn't even know. It's 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 the it's the Politics. feeling that developed in Italy about it. So that's the real Wicca. Real Wicca. And whatever you follow, even if you uh, you follow some 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 Wiccan practice, that's yeah. not the thing. Hmm. I understand that the the need to control or curtail people's urge to call themselves a witch like people i mean i think that ship has sailed we we use that word more widely now even even gardenerians like me um and i'm the one that margot adler looked askance at and called me a hard guard and i mean maybe i am i don't know i think it's uh whatever you know <laughs> i i think uh people practice witchcraft in lots of ways I'm yeah. not going to tell them they're not a real witch. That's ridiculous, you know. It, no, it's, you can't say that. To you. Yeah. I mean, look at this book, right? This is a great example, as you say. This is a hodgepodge of practices, and yeah. she makes a great effort to say what's real and what's not, and none of it has anything to do with, like, any kind of magic or religion that I can say. The unified tradition. I mean, maybe what she's saying is you get to be a witch in all of these ways and the other parts are secret. Yeah. It's not, not for the people who read this book to know. I don't know. That's a very interesting point. Yes, because there is still a very secret side of things that obviously you get to know only if you achieve that stage. It's very interesting. This could be uh, like a, a sort of starting point for whoever is interested to go further. Mm-hmm. Yes, it really does. It, it kind of opens up many doors uh, and points in many interesting directions. Directions. Including like Tibetan practice. I mean, like that's interesting that that's included in there. But the- I just I just looked up turquoise as some um, spiritual protection. I was thinking why why turquoise necessarily in the um, little um, amulet or whatever it was. Right, um, right, right. So yeah. that's that's kind of interesting too. Yeah, I nice. thought absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> the material, yeah. why that? What's that? Sorry. No, I, the material, the stone. Why? Yeah. Mm-hmm. She she often mentions stones. I've, I've yes. noticed in in her books, she's very specific with stones. Mm-hmm. Uh, Colors when she and describes stones. her jewels. Yep. Col- mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. very much so. I think it's worth worth tracking all of those things. We had talked about that maybe making a little chart at some point. Yeah, I had to Google the coin as well. The coin of Knossos or whatever it was. It's like, I don't know what that looks like. I had to. I had to see. There's a labyrinth on the back of the coin. It's quite interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. That was something new I learned this morning reading that. So oh, that's good. <laughs> coin of Knossos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Yes. I think it was C N O S S I S in the book. Right. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. Classes on one. Oh, yes. On Crete. 
I uh, really do. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That particular labyrinth is very familiar. And yeah. I think I'm guessing that what she means in this in this bit where there, you know, where Blake goes and he's like, I want to touch the shiny thing. And he's like, don't touch the shiny thing. And he's like, I can't help it. I touch it. And, and, and I think that just is a, a nice like way to to indicate that an invocation doesn't have to be verbal. You know, it yeah. can be uh, it can be embedded in the, the yeah. material of the coin or the shape or whatever, but also in the stuff it's made from, that it's yeah. implied that it's blood and, and, and other things. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, Im impactful there. Very good. I love the invocation that she has on page 145. Did you? Yes. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> It's a meta poetry, isn't it? Because because she she inserted another piece of literature in a book. Yeah, but can somebody read that bit? Of the, read that again, because I don't have the book in front. Oh yeah, of me, if it's not too long, that's about a half a page. Um, oh. This is the bit where um, old George is oh is, yes is, like these two pages yeah. where he's setting up his yeah. his materials he like uses his regular table yeah. he clears it off he sets some incense he uh he, you know she describes kind of like that that's made of his herbs and the it what it evokes um <laughs> that borderland feeling and he, he says better to do it at dusk you know yeah. this is the best time so liminal time um, yeah that yeah. literally and, and then he has uh, his crystal ball, um, not a witch ball, but I think that's the implication is that it sort of is the same thing. And then the ways in which he uses it, thou ancient providence who art the author of all good things, strengthen we beseech thee thy servants that we may stand fast without fear throughout this dealing and work, enlighten the dark understanding of thy creatures so that our spiritual eye may be opened to know and see the spirits descending in this crystal. And may this shoe stone or speculum be consecrated and blessed to this purpose that no evil phantasm or deception may appear therein. By all things created and contained in the firmament and by their virtues and powers, I constrain the spirits to appear visibly in this crystal stone in fair form and shape and without any hurt or danger of our bodies or souls and to truly to inform and show us the visions of all things that we require without any hindrance or tarrying to appear visibly by this bond of words. And then she like includes mm -hmm. some, you know, you know, lady of the moon and the Lord of death and resurrection and their most point and blah, 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 and all of the elements. And mm -hmm. so like, that's, that's, yeah. that's very like lovely witchy stuff. And then Ashton mm -hmm. is like, so what it be at the end? And, uh, I think that kind of like a moment of, of, uh, of, being able to see it done in a mm -hmm. in a place where clearly there's nothing bad here there's mm -hmm. no they, there's no bad stuff here so blake gets a very clear idea of what real witches do even without saying this is what real witches do or i mean he's not he's an old cunning folk and yet they are working together and he's using mm -hmm. these tools and doing this thing and and then you get to see him uh, scrying and uh, and what what he got up. There's a there's a sort of ceremonial magical kind of feel to that as well of drawing the spirit into the crystal kind of thing, and I then feel very Doreen to me. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. this whole bit feels really uh, instruction to me. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. this is how you do it, yeah. or at least this is one way, you know. Or yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I can Blake suggest says, to this friends way. are interesting people. I don't quite see how we're much forwarder. And Ashton says, charming people is a good way to describe them. <laughs> 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 nice. Very cute, Doreen. Yes. Thank you for that pun. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. That was lovely. Uh, but are we decide? Uh, did we decide on the next? Oh no, I'll keep the recording then till we decide to do next. Yeah. Yes, I know our time is up. We have a uh we have we had some conversation last time about which book we might do next. 
Yeah, and I think that, that we had mentioned that uh, my notes anyway say rebirth of witchcraft. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. And I also know that in the preface to this particular book, um, that uh, the like her last book, Doreen's last book, is mentioned as being kind of her magnum opus. And I wonder if it, I don't really have a good sense of which one might be better to read together. I mean, maybe we'll get oh. to all of them. I don't know, but. Do you I know the last all... one. So, sorry, Maggie, did you mean the, the last one she wrote with? Uh... Evan John Jones. No, I don't no, think I mean one. that one. You don't mean that one. Um, um, witchcraft for tomorrow's. It was witchcraft for tomorrow. Well yeah, regarded, isn't it? Yeah, I think that her, her that biggest is, uh, and and uh, focus, and focus. what Philip Heselton describes as as her magnum opus. Yes, she's definitely that's definitely a manifesto. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> that's interesting. So are we are we going to do uh, rebirth of witchcraft? Yeah, that'll mm -hmm. take us all to the whole rest of the year, then, won't it? Really, probably. That sounds and good. That's okay. I think <laughs> we can go as slow as we want to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I think it's less problematic. I think it's better to start with that. That is fine. I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, good. I think our next scheduled date would be June 5th, and uh, we hope that people can come and join us again for that. Good. Thank you all very much. It's lovely to see you all and to have a chance to talk about this book with you again. I have so many more notes and things to learn about now. Yes, and we're unpeeling the layers as well, aren't we? It's yep. Yes. And, uh, I feel it's it's getting a little bit like a, a workshop, something like that. I feel we 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 are facilitating each other. Well, this is how I feel at least. I I feel I'm getting facilitated by all of you in understanding things and learning quite a lot. It's, very, it's quite I feel a privilege. The same way. You're you're bringing so much to the conversation. I'm learning so much from you. I think this is a, definitely a sh mutual sharing. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank everyone. you very much. Great to see you all. Happy belting. Great belting. Oh yeah, Merry Belting. Belting. <laughs> belting. Bye. 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 Ciao.